Yes, um, even though it's uh, one minute or two, uh, too early, I think we could start now. So welcome everybody this afternoon at four o'clock. Um, uh, we have our first um, talk. We have a double header this, uh, this afternoon. Uh, the first talk will be given by Dr. Gerard uh, Gers. And Dr. Gers, um, he got her PhD from, uh, from Banshrai. Uh, uh, it's a, a technical tennis university, bounce right? Am I right? Yeah. And uh, and uh, you under you study under um, it's Mushman. Is it Mushman or under uh, whom? Uh, no, it was um, with uh, Karl Heinz Glasmeier. Okay, uh, the great uh, uh, Karl Heinz, the great, right? <laughs> and uh, um, so she is uh, trained as the I would say pediatrician. Uh, the and uh, but uh, I think during her graduate studies, uh, she was closely involved in the Rosetta mission because uh, Professor Glass, uh, uh, Karl Hans Glassmeyer uh, was the PI of the metometer team on Rosetta, so so that uh, she has uh, she has a handle on every drop of data, and uh, in fact we owe her a lot uh, for look at the data very carefully and finding some very interesting effect, which she will tell us. The title is um, title is the plasma environment of of uh, of a comet, right? The Rosetta, an unusual plasma laboratory. Indeed, I mean the cometary plasma physics is very intriguing. You know? I think that even after so many years, we still don't understand. Uh, I think, but then, but then, uh, uh, Cheryl knows a lot. <laughs> Let her tell us about it. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. All right. Thanks for the introduction and uh, thanks for having me. Um... Yeah, I'm gonna um, talk about the plasma around uh, 67P today. Yes, um, I'm not gonna spend much on this title slide, it's very boring. Um, I, um, I will already start with uh, kind of a guide, a, a line that goes through this talk. So first of all, I'm gonna introduce comets a bit um, and then go more into cometary plasma physics because that's what I do. Um, and then I will go into Rosetta and why the mission was so cool and why it was so difficult. And then I will highlight two different um, processes or structures that we've been able to observe with Rosetta near the comet, because I think those are um, very interesting and also can tell us something about other plasmas in the solar system. Uh, and then I'm going to close with kind of an outlook to the future, what we're planning to do in the next couple of years. All right, so um, comets. So the comet I'm going to talk most about today is the, the big one. The um, You should be able to see my cursor. Um, so this one, it's called Comet 67P, Torium of Gerasimenko. Um, and you do have to to um, practice a bit until you can say the whole word. So we usually call it Turi or 67P. Um, and it's a very common comet. Uh, it's four kilometers roughly in diameter. Uh, it has a very low density. So if you put it in a bathtub, it would float. Um, and this low density comes from it being um, very dusty and especially very fluffy. So if you find like a dust moat in your home somewhere, um, it's just a little bit more compressed than that. Um, if you look at your cappuccino in the morning with a nice milk froth on top, that's about the consistency of the surface of the comet. Um, however, comets are special because they also contain ice, um, and we're going to come back to that later. Uh, however, why comets are so interesting to people studying the solar system is that they are basically what's left over from solar system formation. And um, we know that all of them have kind of a weird shape. They're never round. Um, so we have this weird um, one down here. I believe that's Hartley. And this is a uh, Halley's Comet. Um, and then I snuck in a comet that's not a comet yet, because this is a Kuiper Belt object. Uh, this is um, the Kuiper Belt object that was visited by the NASA probe New Horizons. and. Um, we believe that the comets that we see in the solar system today originate from these Kuiper belt objects. So it's really interesting to compare them directly, the observations from the object in situ very far out in the solar system to the comet that we can observe in the solar system. 
And so we study comets usually because we want to know how the solar system formed and we try to learn more about the comet's composition, its um, makeup, its uh, yeah, structure. However, um, I'm not super interested in that because I'm interested in the plasma. And so for me, the most important features of comets are that they're not magnetized, so they don't have an intrinsic magnetic field not even small ones, so it doesn't have um, a remnant surface magnetization either. Um, we were able to show that with Rosetta. Um, and they start outgassing near the sun. So these are the, the main um, characteristics that we're going to talk about. Um, so I just thought I'd uh, give a short overview about where comets come from. So we have the solar system and the Kuiper belt. And this is usually where our short period comets come from, like 67P, it has um, a period of about six and a half years. Um, and this means that for those comets, the inclination is usually quite small, and they're um, usually Jupiter family comets because they've been called by Jupiter. Um, and we observe quite a lot of these um, because they, we, we've been able to observe them quite a few orbits already, so we will be able to predict them quite well. Um, however, comets can also originate from the Oort cloud, which surrounds the Kuiper belt. Um, and because the Oort cloud surrounds the entire solar system in all three dimensions, the comets coming from the Oort cloud usually um, have any inclination they want. And they um, are also typically longer period comets. Um, however, what uh, wakes comets really interesting to kind of the layman, I think, is the, the tails because uh, you can observe them from Earth. And there's been a lot of historical evidence of people um, observing comets. There's uh, paintings, uh, the very famous tapestry of Bayeux, which has the comet that predicted, I think it was that Harold would lose against the English or something. Um, but usually comets are kind of seen as harbingers of doom. Um, when the uh, giant comet was observed uh, after Julius Caesar had died, uh, they kind of saw it as uh, yeah, a, a, a sign that there would be trouble ahead. And indeed, while well, Caesar was killed and there were um, a lot of battles trying to figure out who would be his successor. So, I always think it's very funny that this thing that we study very close in situ um, and the plasma that we observe there also has an influence on human history. All right, so I've been talking about the outgassing. Um, so I brought two um, pictures here. These were taken by the Osiris camera on board Rosetta. And these were colored to show um, surface ice. So the comet is mostly dust on the outside. However, we can also, especially in shaded regions, observe surface ices directly. And this is usually water, but we also have a significant contribution from CO2 ices. And as soon as the comet on its elliptical orbit comes closer to the sun, it will start heating up the ices and they eventually sublimate and expand into space. And because comets are so small, they don't really have any gravitation. So this atmosphere is not an atmosphere at all. It's more of an exosphere because it escapes um, and expands freely into the vacuum. And what happens to this expanding um, neutral atmosphere is that eventually it will get ionized. Um, so that means that from the neutrals, we start to produce uh, water molecules and electrons. And depending on where we are along the comet's orbit, this can either produce a lot of um, water ions, so heavy ions we call them because they're much heavier than the solar wind. Um, and I just brought this, uh, sh this figure where you can see on the bottom plot, you can see the um, heliocentric distance of the comet. So we started visiting the comet with Rosetta at 3.8 AU, and you can see it's perihelion at 1.24 AU. Um, and as the comet gets closer and closer, this um, gas production rate here gets higher and higher. So we start out at um, about 10 to the 26th. We ignore this bit at the beginning. That's um, 
the model used here is not very accurate. Um, but basically, we go up to um, 10 to the 29, roughly. Um, and then as the comet goes away again from the sun, from its perihelion towards its aphelion, uh, we see a decrease in this gas production rate again. And this gas production rate is incredibly important. Any kind of process that I'll be talking about today depends on this gas production rate because it depends on the amount or the density of the ions that is available to the plasma. Um, and I just wanted to give a little bit of perspective. So um, these are the, oops, sorry. Uh, these are the gas production rates of uh, different comets visited. So the gas production rates on the bottom here, and you can see that Comet Heli had a gas production rate of roughly about 10 to the 30. Um, and then we also have Jacobini Zinner and Comet Borelli, which are a little bit lower, um, as well as Greek Scalarup. Uh, but you can also clearly see that while these were all flybys at a single gas production rate, Rosetta was the first mission that covered a large range of gas production rates which means that we can actually see the comet environment develop while we're there measuring. And this is, I think, what was the real value of this mission was that we have this really long set of data um, that we can now compare to what, what we were able to observe with Halley. Um, yes, yeah, so when we have the ionization of the water molecules, uh, this can happen through different processes. Uh, the most common is photoionization. So just uh, because the sun's shining, uh, the water will get ionized eventually. Um, but we also see ionization due to charge exchange with the solar wind um, and electron impact ionization. And I just wanted to point out two of the colors here. Um, so we again have the heliocentric distance on the bottom. And then this is the ionization frequency. So it shows you how many uh, molecules are ionized per second through a uh, process. So the orange line is photoionization. And as you would expect, this is highest when you're close to the sun and it's lowest when you're far away, just because it expands into 3D space, right? However, what's really interesting is that um, despite what we expected, electron impact ionization is actually the dominating process when we are far away from the sun. So um, around about here. So the, the blue line for um, electron impact ionization is higher than the orange line. And again, um, towards the end of the Rosetta mission. And this is why um, one of the highlights that I will be talking about later can only happen at these kinds of um, heliocentric distances, because it's really important that we have a lot of electron impact ionization. Right, so we have produced a neutral cloud around the comet um, through the sublimation of gas. We have then ionized this neutral cloud. Uh, and now the question is what happens to it? Because obviously the solar system is not empty. Um, we have a solar wind that is emanated by the sun. It's um, a plasma that is very fast with 400 kilometers per second roughly, um, but it has very light ions, protons and a little bit helium and it has a magnetic field, the magnetic field of the sun that it carries with it. And the solar wind now encounters this plasma cloud around the comet, and this plasma cloud is made up of very heavy ions, but they are very slow. So the fundamental question that we always ask in cometary plasma physics is, how are these cometary ions incorporated in the solar wind? Because somehow they need to interact. So, there's different ways to look at this. Um, I thought it would be best to just um, line out the easiest way for this talk, um, because I think there's not necessarily just plasma physicists here. Uh, so if you are a plasma physicist, I'm very sorry, this might be a little bit easy. Um, but uh, basically the way to model this properly is to look at the MHD equations. So this is the, the mass uh, conservation equation and add a mass source term. So this mass source term then would be the uh, ions produced by the comet. However, I think there's a better way to look at this, and this is by looking at a train. So we have our solar wind train, and this has a constant power output, uh, which means it has a certain velocity 
uh, which I always call V as SW, so V solo wind. However, if we start putting these heavy ions into the solar wind, so we add mass to our train, like a comet, for example, we have to slow down the train because we only have a constant power output, right? So what that means is that the train will get slower, but the mass that we push on the train will obviously have been accelerated. And we can add more and more mass to this train. Um, we could even add a llama. And what that will result in at the end is that we transfer energy from the solar wind to the mass that we add to the solar wind. And that comes at the cost of slowing down the solar wind. Um, and then there's another very important concept that we use in plasma physics quite a lot, which is called the frozen in theorem. And basically what that means is that we have a volume of plasma that has a magnetic field um, and this magnetic field, the magnetic field lines, if you want to call them that, cannot leave this volume of plasma. So if I start deforming this volume, the magnetic field lines follow. So in our case at the comet, this means that if I start with a solar wind plasma that has a very high velocity, but a low density and a low magnetic field, um, when I start to reduce the velocity, it means I have to increase the density of the plasma but it also means I have to increase the magnetic field because it can't leave this plasma value. So basically you're just compressing everything. And this leads to um, a mass loaded plasma that contains solar wind and cometary ions, but it has a lower velocity and it has a very high density and a high magnetic field. And this is something that we can model. So this is, um, now, if you're pretending to sit on the line that connects the comet and the sun directly, so you're basically following the solar wind as it approaches the comet. And we start off uh, with the first panel here, which is the solar wind velocity. And we start off at 400 kilometers per second is a very typical value. Um, and then we have the magnetic field, which starts off around two nanotesla. And then we have the solar wind uh, density, which starts off also around two particles per cubic centimeter. But as we start to approach the comet, we see that the density of the cometary ions here in blue increases significantly. Because we're starting to mass load this plasma, what we're going to see is that the velocity has to decrease and decrease and decrease. And on, at the same time, the magnetic field increases. We also see a slight increase in the solar wind density due to the compression, but most of the density increase indeed comes from the cometary ions. So this seems all very nice. The problem is, um, as with any fluid, you can only transfer a certain amount of energy before it gets mad at you. Um, and this is uh, where the bow shock comes in. So this is a very um, common phenomenon in the solar system is that if you have a stationary object um, like a magnetosphere or a planet or a comet in the solar wind, the solar wind is supersonic, so it's very fast. It needs to be shocked before it can go around the object. And we see exactly the same thing um, at comets. Uh, and in this model, you see it as a, a, a sharp decrease in the solar wind velocity because the solar wind has to go around um, and a sharp increase in the magnetic field. And this is also something we know from Earth when you look at bow waves for ships, for example. So this, I think, is really nice because it's the different way of looking at a process that is ubiquitous in our lives, and I think we can learn a lot about it. Um, yes, and for those that are super interested in plasma physics, I just wanted to add this um, more 2D picture of what's going on. So um, we have the sun on this side again, and then the comet here in the middle. And you obviously not only on the stagnation streamline, but you're also going around it. Uh, you have deflection of the solar wind. You have draping of the magnetic field. Um, and there's loads and loads going on. Um, and especially at uh, Comet 67P, we're dealing with GPS effects, but I won't go into detail um, on them, I could give another talk entirely just about that. 
Right. Um, however, what we've learned is that this picture fits very well, especially at high activity commas, um, such as uh, Halley, which has uh, this activity of 10 to the 30 molecules per second. However, um, at 67p with its lower activity, we can go um, into more detail and can actually see what happens when the activity is very low and when this bow shock hasn't formed yet, for example. All right, but before we talk about the observations of Rosetta, I think it's important to actually tell you what Rosetta is. Um, so this is my favorite spacecraft. Um, just for purely emotional reasons, because it was the, the first spacecraft I ever worked on. Um, and Rosetta, the mission, was a um, very long mission. Uh, it was launched in 2004, and it um, basically toured the solar system, saw a couple of the sites, took pictures of uh, asteroids, um, Mars, uh, and Earth, um, then went into hibernation because it went out really far into the outer solar system. And finally, 10 years after launch in uh, August 2014, it arrived at Comet 67P. Um, and this is why I make a distinction between the Rosetta spacecraft and the Rosetta mission. The Rosetta mission contained two spacecraft, the Rosetta spacecraft and the lander Philae. So in November 2014, the lander Philae was deployed towards the surface and um, yeah, it bounced around a bit but it was the first, second, and third landing on a comet that humanity has ever done. Uh, unfortunately, the lander only lived for a couple of hours, but the orbiter of Rosetta itself uh, continued to collect data for um, almost two years. Uh, and uh, in, in this um, plot, it says uh, nominal mission end is 2014, but we actually got an extension, so we managed to keep the spacecraft alive until 30th of September 2016, uh, where someone decided to deliberately crash it into the comet uh, to end the mission and give us some really nice observations from the last couple of kilometers. So the really special thing about this is that we have these two years of data. And the data that we have uh, for this talk mostly comes from the plasma instrument. So this is um, a sketch of Rosetta. The spacecraft, you can see the lander fillet is still attached at the front here. Um, but the instruments that will be most important for this talk is uh, the magnetometer down here in the boom. Then we have a Langmuir probe to get the density of the plasma. And we have uh, IES and uh, ICA to uh, get the composition as well as the ion and electron spectrum. Uh, we also have cameras, which are absolutely gorgeous, but I hate because they want to point at the comet all the time. They want to be as close as possible all the time, which is what I, as a plasma physicist, do not prefer. So Rosetta was uh, very much an exercise of uh, different people trying to get the best science out of the instruments while that clearly meant that someone needed to sacrifice something. Um, however, we're very grateful to have um, as much data as we do. The magnetometer, for example, ran almost continuously, except for a couple of uh, switch-offs uh, for those two years. So what's the not so nice thing about Rosetta? Well, it's only one point measurements. So for the plasma physicist here, uh, obviously, the multi-point measurements is, is the newest thing. Well, newest in the sense that cluster has been doing it for 20 years, but uh, everyone wants to do multi-point measurements, and this was not possible with Rosetta. Um, we also had to deal with a very negative spacecraft potential, so we can't really measure the low energy ions, and the, all of the instruments are really hard to calibrate. This is not a plasma spacecraft which means that we're not priority and we don't get a spinning spacecraft, for example, which would be really nice. We don't even get rolls um, and the boom's very short with just 1.5 meters. Uh, so yeah, there is limits to the data, but there's still loads to accomplish. I would also say that another limit of the data is our trajectory. So. If you've worked with planetary spacecraft before, you um, probably expect the trajectory to be quite orbit-like, where it's a circle and it repeats and it repeats. 
this is not what Rosetta did. The comet basically has no gravitation to speak of, uh, which means you can fly any kind of shape around the comet that you want. There are some elliptical orbits like this one uh, that are a little bit more stable, but yeah, you can just have a kink in it. Um, you can do weird stuff, you can turn around. It really doesn't matter. Um, there's no yeah, advantage to just doing the um, elliptical orbits. So with Rosetta, the, um, this orbit ended up to being very much driven by the as close as possible approach. Um, so we have a couple close flybys, but most of the time we try to be as close as possible. I'm not going to play this to the end because it's very repetitive. Um, instead, I will show you a little plot of um, the blue line here, which is the uh, spacecraft's distance to the comet. And you can see we arrive here um, in August 2014, and then we're kind of going close and close and closer, as close as we can, um, as we learn more about the shape and the gravitation and um, all the other forces around the comet. Uh, then we deliver the lander sometime here, and then we continue with our science phase, um, which included close flybys. And these close flybys just meant that we go away for a bit and then basically point the spacecraft at the comet and make it miss the comet. This worked very well for the first time. The second time did not. Um, and that's why this GIF on the, le uh, on the left side shows this uh, absolutely beautiful dust environment of the comet. So in the back, the points are all move in one direction. Those are stars. However, you can see a lot of activity, the long streaks that is dust. And this dust environment turned out to be um, a horrible um, detriment, basically, to the mission because uh, Rosetta uses star trackers to navigate. Um, however, if the dust environment get too, gets too dense, uh, Rosetta misidentifies the dust as stars and then loses orientation. And this is exactly what happened during the uh, second close flyby that we did, where we went very close to the comet. The dust environment was too much. Uh, the spacecraft lost orientation and went into a safe mode. And this was very scary um, because you almost lost a billion euro spacecraft. So after that, the mission decided to um, be a little bit more careful about it, and we never get got to get uh, close during the very high activity phase around uh, perihelion, basically. Um, from a plasma point of view, this was also not great because it meant that any time the activity increased, the spacecraft had to move further out, stay out of the densest part of the dust environment, which also meant that we basically, in, in the plasma sense, we didn't move. Oops, sorry. Oh, oh no. Um, I hope you can still see this. Um, I'm going to stop this because my computer is uh, complaining about the video. But uh, basically, uh, yeah, on the, on the plasma point of view, this means, yeah, we're, we're having quite a bit of trouble. Can you still see me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, I'm just going to try and click this away whenever it um, comes up. I put a lot of videos in this presentation, which might not have been a good idea. Anyway, yes, but uh, so basically Rosetta is great, but we have to deal with a lot of issues with it. So um, that's why the science that we look into uh, is kind of what you would do with the first mission that goes to a comet. Uh, it's uh, very much focused on individual things where we know that we can trust our data. Um, and so that brings me to the spotlights that I wanted to talk about. So the first spotlight is for the low gas production rate. So uh, at the beginning of mission and then also at the end. And um, 
I want to start with something that people probably know about, which is Aurora. So if you've ever been near the polar regions, uh, you may have been lucky enough to see an Aurora. I doubt that anyone's been able to see the Aurora from space. If so, I'm very jealous. Um, but this is a phenomenon that's very well known from Earth um, and it's pretty well understood. So basically, uh, as you you have the solar wind, it interacts with uh, the Earth's magnetosphere. And under certain circumstances, you can have uh, electrons traveling along this magnetic field uh, and being accelerated, and they're being accelerated into the atmosphere where they start to uh, ionize the atmosphere and that uh, gives emissions. So this is why you see the different colors as well, because it's different emission bands. And this is a phenomenon that at Earth is very well understood, but we can also, well, okay, so the um, important bit here is that it is caused by atmospheric excitation due to accelerated electrons. So we're going to keep focusing on that. And we also see this at other solar system bodies. For example, Jupiter has a very beautiful uh, ultraviolet aurora, which has been imaged by a Hubble Space Telescope. But Jupiter, um, also has a very strong magnetic field, so we would expect there to be aurora. For Saturn, the same thing. We also see an aurora near the poles uh, because also Saturn has a very strong magnetic field that can accelerate these electrons. However, we also see aurora at Mars, and we not only see diffuse aurora, but we also see like spot-like auroras. And this is a bit strange because Mars does not have a global magnetic field where you can kind of accelerate the electrons into the atmosphere. So in this case, it's a different mechanism. It's the remnant, the, the crustal field that sometimes is aligned well enough to actually accelerate electrons enough to give you a little bit of a diffuse aurora. But from this, we would not expect there to be aurora at a comet because the comet does have does really not have a magnetic field. Mars, at least, has these crustal fields, the mini magnetospheres, but the comet doesn't have anything. However, um, in a paper by uh, Marie van Galland uh, two years ago, she actually showed that the comet does have an ultraviolet aurora. And the way this works is that we still have the solar wind and we do accelerate electrons quite a lot in the cometary environment. And if this electron then um, finds a water molecule, it can actually, through electron impact ionization, produce um, an excited water molecule, which then uh, emits UV light. And it was possible to observe this with Rosetta because it does have a UV camera on board. So the question is now, well, but what accelerates the electrons? And um, this is simply because the comet is kind of a potential well. Um, if we look at the um, magnetic field up here, so this is the magnetic field, and basically Rosetta in, in this um, plot was traveling closer to the comet and then further away again. And so you very nicely see that the closer you get to the comet, you see higher uh, magnetic field values. And then you see lower magnetic field values as you travel away again. And this is reflected in the electric field as well, which is uh, shown with in this plot with the, the green arrows. So these green arrows all point towards the comet. We call this an ambipolar electric field. And this ambipolar electric field at low gas production rates is actually enough to accelerate the electrons enough as they kind of like a bicycle, they fall into this potential well where they get accelerated and then as they leave again, they get decelerated. However, if they encounter a water molecule when they are this accelerated down in the bottom of a potential well, they can produce this aurora. Um, so in this case, we don't actually need a proper global or even tiny remnant magnetic field. We can just live with a kind of pilot magnetic field at the comet to produce electrons that can then produce auroras. I find this really interesting because it means that 
this this um, kind of acceleration excitation process seems to be very ubiquitous um, and we should look in more weird places for it um, not just the planets because they I mean there we already know about right so um, we have observed this aurora um, but I want to go into another uh, process that we've been able to observe which is my spotlight too and this is something we can only see at high gas production rates. So when we have a very dense cloud of ions surrounding the comet. Um, and this spotlight is the diamagnetic cavity. So why am I talking about this? Well, this was my first project when I started working with the data on Rosetta. Uh, basically, while the mission was running, what I would do is I would go into the office in the morning, I would download the data from the day before, I would just give it a once over to make sure everything was okay with the magnetometer. It was measuring kind of what we were expecting to measure. Um, but in 2015, I downloaded the data and I saw something really strange um, that we kind of expected. We weren't sure what it would look like. So that was the diamagnetic cavity. So again, we come back to this concept of uh, pileup of the magnetic field and slowing down of solar wind. Um, so this is a very old uh, paper from 1967. Um, very simple MHD model of the cometary environment. Uh, again, on the Sun comet line, um, we start with a solar wind at 400 kilometers per second. Um, then this sharp drop here, that's the bow shock that I was talking about before. Um, but what's really important is that the closer and the closer and the closer to the comet you get, this velocity of the solar wind will drop and drop more until it finally reaches zero. And this zero means that the solar wind train with all of its mass that we put on it actually stopped entirely. However, because the magnetic field that we measure at the comet is tied to this solar wind fluid, um, the magnetic field also stops. So if we can stop the solar wind, we can stop the magnetic field. And that means if we then go a little bit further with our spacecraft, what we should see is that we should not be able to observe any solar wind and we should be able, not be able to observe any magnetic field. It means the field should drop to zero. And this is exactly what we were able to observe. So this is um, from the first paper that reported this time magnetic cavity. And you can see this is a time series of the magnetic field measurements. This is very typical um, field for um, the plasma near perihelion. And then suddenly you have this time interval here where the magnetic field is very close to zero and it's also very quiet. It doesn't look like anything like what we were able to observe before or afterwards. And this is what the diamagnetic cavity looks like. And we kind of expected for Rosetta to be inside the diamagnetic cavity for quite a long time during perihelion. However, because of this um, dust problem, we actually managed to be kind of on the edge of the diamagnetic cavity, which meant that any time it expanded or contracted, Rosetta would go into the diamagnetic cavity and out of it again. Um, and so in the end, this uh, meant that we actually had 712 events where Rosetta entered and left the diamagnetic cavity over the whole mission. Uh, concentrated around perihelion, obviously. So this is really exciting because it gives us an opportunity to study this in uh, much more detail than um, we were able to do before. Um, and this already tells us something about the structure because if you remember, I showed a kind of a 2D picture of the environment before and there was the diamagnetic cavity in the middle surrounding the comet that was very much a circle. However, if we want to be able to observe these very quick successions, like this 10 seconds, 20 seconds between these events, um, the only way we can do this in the plasma that we have is if the boundary of the diamagnetic cavity itself is um, a wave, right? So if Rosetta sits here and this boundary is kind of wavy, it means that it can move um, over the spacecraft and go back and forth and give us this really, really quick succession. And this is really interesting because it means that the entire inner coma, this entire inner part of the plasma environment is very much unstable. We're, we think that we're never in an equilibrium 
uh, situation in this case. Um, so, yeah, if you look at this, so this is the diamagnetic cavity kind of as a sketch again. Um, yeah, we don't, we don't really have this uh, nice round shape. We have a wavy shape. But what's important is that we also see this uh, field line draping around the diamagnetic cavity. So as the solar wind approaches, the field lines uh, on this uh, on the sun comet line get slowed down more than those that are far away, just because they encounter less density, which means that overall the kind of field line drapes around the comet. This is why we observe these uh, very high magnetic fields up to uh, 300 nanotesla, while in the solar wind we only have up to five nanotesla. Um, but this brings us to a problem because um, while we can stop the solar wind, if we wait long enough, diffusion should move the magnetic field that has been piled up in front of the diamagnetic cavity, move it into the diamagnetic cavity and collapse it. Um, however, it doesn't. So there needs to be a force that keeps the magnetic field outside of the diamagnetic cavity. And to find out what this force is, we look back in history. And there was a very nice experiment called the Artificial Comet Experiment, which you should look up because it's really insane. Um, but in this case, they created an artificial comet by exploding a little canister with gas in the solar wind. It created a plasma cloud that was expanding and it created a diamagnetic cavity. And in that case, the, uh, this force that pushes out the magnetic field was the electron thermal pressure. Um, then in the same year, they uh, had a Giotto fly by Comet Halley and found that this electron thermal pressure was not enough to keep out the magnetic field. So they came up with an alternative theory where basically any time the, um, the magnetic field along with its ions was trying to push into the cloud, um, the dense cloud uh, inside the diamagnetic cavity, it would actually collide with neutrals and get slowed down. And this iron neutral friction, as we call it, would keep out the field. Um, and if we look at these numbers, so this is the artificial comet experiment. This is one Halley, and this is 67P. All of these numbers don't look that different, except for this one. Um, so the, this is the um, photo ionization frequency. And because of the ions that they used in this artificial comet experiment, this was very much different from what we see in real comets. So in this case, I tend to just ignore the artificial comet experiment for now um, and focus on uh, Comet Halley. And this is what the observations there look like. So basically, Giotto, um, unlike Rosetta, which was sitting in the plasma environment, Giotto did a flyby, which meant it crossed through the entire diamagnetic cavity. And they also found uh, that the boundary is probably wavy, which is great because that agrees with what we've been seeing. Um, but otherwise, it's really hard to compare these observations because they're so fundamentally different. Because this diamagnetic cavity is not as unstable as the one we have. These waves are very tiny compared to the extent of the diamagnetic cavity at Halley. Um, while what Rosetta found at 67P was that the waves were basically of the size of the diamagnetic cavity. So it's, it's really difficult, but we can still take the model from Halley and apply it to Rosetta and see if we can predict where Rosetta should see the diamagnetic cavity. Um, and so this is what uh, was done in this paper with Tima et al. Uh, and you can see that the, the red crosses show where the diamagnetic cavity should be and uh, where we observed it. And then the blue line shows where it should be. And it kind of works, but also kind of doesn't. Um, for example, here there's uh, very clearly we should um, uh, be able to observe it, but we don't. There's, uh, yeah, this very clearly we shouldn't be able to observe it, but we do. So it doesn't really work reliably, which makes me think that there's something very wrong about this model. 
And I personally think um, that it's because the ion neutral friction model is not applicable here. Um, because as Halley is a very much denser plasma, we have photochemical equilibrium, which means that we produce um, an ion from a neutral, which then gets recombined and is again a, um, a neutral, which means in essence, this ion can't move because anytime it's created and it tries to move away, it's already recombined. Um, however, at 67P, um, we don't have such a high recombination rate, which means that the ion can actually travel outside. And this means that if we uh, relate the diamagnetic cavity radius, RC, to the gas production rate um, and the magnetic field, we see that the dependence on the gas production rate is very much different for 67P and Halley. So we expect an exponent of 0.75 or an exponent of 1. However, if we look at the actual exponent, so let's just look at this um, for simplicity's sake. So this is RC times BM. So basically, uh, I put this magnetic field on the other side of the equation and um, the gas production right here. And if I put a line through this, what I should get is an exponent around 1 or 0.75. And we get neither. So this tells us that this ion neutron friction force model is probably not applicable here. And we think that this is because the ion neutron friction force at 67p is not particularly effective because the neutral gas cloud is less dense. And we can show this by uh, looking at the velocities. So if the ion neutral friction is important, it means that the ions and the neutrals have the same velocity because Anytime we try to accelerate an ion, it collides with a neutral and it gets slowed down again. Um, however, we very clearly find that this is not the case because the neutral velocity that we measure is below one kilometer per second, but the ion velocities that we measure, um, so here from a paper by Otto Stubb, um, is very much higher than that um, by a factor of three or four. So very clearly, this collision is not very effective, which means that the ion neutral friction force cannot be responsible for keeping out the magnetic field um, in the diamagnetic cavity. And um, this is a problem because we don't have any other ideas. Uh, so if anyone has a really cool idea, please let me know. Um, well, there's many, many open questions still with this. We don't really understand how the boundary works, uh, how unstable it is, what the electric fields do, what about the low energy ions, and um, I haven't even talked about the electrons. So there's still a lot to do, which is great because we have a mission coming up. So um, this mission is called Comet Interceptor, and you should definitely go and follow it on Twitter um, or, I don't know, look it up uh, ESA's pages because it's really insane and really cool. So basically, what, what we're trying to do is try and intercept a dynamically new comet. So a comet that hasn't been close to the sun, a comet that hasn't done an orbit, but those are very hard to predict because you usually only see them about a year or two in advance because you can't predict an orbit because it's not on an orbit. Uh, so the only way to do this is to launch a spacecraft and let it sit somewhere in orbit and wait until you find a suitable target. Um, and this is exactly what Comet Interceptor is supposed to do. Um, hopefully we'll launch in 2029 and wait around at the uh, L2 point. And once we've identified a suitable target, we'll fly by. And the really exciting bit about this is that this will be the first flyby with three separate spacecraft, which all have at least a magnetometer. We tried to get more, but we only got a magnetometer on each spacecraft. This will be the first multi-point measurement at a comet that we've ever done. So we're really excited about this, and we're really hoping that it can help us answer these questions about the diamond cavity and other questions that we have. And then if we go even more into the future, um, in 2019, me and some um, colleagues wrote a white paper about what we should do in the future with cometary plasma science. And we basically went wild 
and said, if you ever go back to a comet with a spacecraft, you should take a couple of subspacecraft to measure the plasma, uh, to orbit the comet, to do radial sweeps, to be really crazy about it. Um, and also we have uh, Halley returning in 2061, and it is a very active comet, it's super interesting. All we had is a couple of flybys, wouldn't it be worth to go there and spend a little bit more time? So this is what we outline in this paper. Um, if you're interested, you could just uh, Google it. And yeah, I'm going to stop here before I run horribly over. Uh, I just wanted to leave with uh, three messages. So if you're interested in how plasmas work, the comet environment is super, super interesting plasma laboratory because you find conditions that you cannot replicate so easily somewhere else. Um, and the cometary activity itself is so variable that you can cover a lot of scale sizes and processes. You can see all kinds of weird things um, and learn how a plasma reacts and how things are accelerated, how energy is transferred, how cross coupling works. Um, so I definitely think it's worth it uh, continuing to study it. Um, because we do have so many open questions that we can still address uh, in future missions. And yeah, I'll stop here and let me know if you have questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Sherrod. Um, any question from the audience? <clears throat> we still have some time. I mean, I can already see. Uh, okay, uh, Lin Chi Hong, uh, uh, you have a question? Mm, okay, so uh, Professor so I has a uh, three questions. It's uh, first one is uh, just like we know ion tail and the dust tail, their direction is different. So my question is uh, is uh, because our ion tail and dust tail they have the same origin. So after they left the comet a uh, short distance later, and they will be separate. So before they separate, the inferior ion it should have some possibility they will be impact the dust particle. So before dust and the ion tail separate, well, the ion tail and the dust tail, there's a two tail, they, um, they interference each other's the, there's a orbit. Yeah, so this is the first question, thank you. Yes, um, so do they interfere with the orbit um, on the scales that you can observe with telescopes? Probably not, um, just because they're so big and the effects that we're talking about are usually um, quite small. However, we have, we think that we may have observed um, dust charging. So where the um, electrons in the environment charge the dust and then make it move in directions where it shouldn't go. Um, but this is on very small scales and you won't be able to observe it in the, in the giant tail structure. Um, I think the solar wind is more responsible um, for impacting the tail because of the, the pressure uh, that exerts on the tail. Uh, than any local processes. Okay, so my second question is uh, because we know the different common has a different shape of the coma, like something uh, common, maybe their coma, this is a big round, it's like the recent one common is called C2070 K2, so their coma, this is a very large round shape, it's like the for Jupiter, but Holly common, this is a one a long tail. So which factor that can be depending the shape and the size of this uh, comet tail. So this is a second uh, second question, thank you. Yes, yeah, oh, it's a very good question and I'm afraid that I can't really answer it because Rosetta was very much focused on the innermost part of the coma and we, we're we really severely lacking in observations that can tie to remote observations where you see large tail structures, for example. The, the reason this, that we were lacking in this is because the uh, 67P was really badly positioned to see the um, plasma tail and also the dust tail to a certain extent um, with remote instruments, um, with telescopes from Earth, basically. So this is another hope that we have for comet interceptors that for the first time we'll be able to actually observe the two tails with remote observations while we also fly through it with a spacecraft and can measure in situ how it works and hopefully be able to relate structures in the inner coma to structures in the wider tail. Um, but up until now, we really don't know. Mm, okay, so my final question is because just like you said, there is a plasma, magnetic file, and the electricity flows is around the comet. 
the less kinds of thing um, there will be interference and radio wave um, communication. So how does something sort of like the Rosetta's and the uh, deep impact and start, uh, start does this kind of satellite um, to prevent this the plasma interference the radio communication. Yeah. And also, of course, come from impact and damage come from the rock and gas. So, so this is a very cons uh, yeah. last question. Yeah. So um, with Rosetta, because of the electric fields that we're talking about are so small, it does not interfere with communications at all. Um, even if we go to the inner coma, there's uh, no problem. Uh, there's no reflection. We basically see any, don't see any attenuation in the signal. The only thing what we can do with the radio waves is uh, basically reconstruct the gravity field uh, of the comet. Uh, and this has been done, and it was used in the shape model and in determining the density of the nucleus. But how about the rod? It will be as a many rod use very fast be going to impact the satellite in the tail inside. Sorry, can you say that again? Mm, I say because when the gas flow, they are shoot out come from the uh, comets, they also carry the dust and their small rock. So this is a small rock, they will be used very fast to be going to impact the satellite and destroy it. So. Yeah, so... Um... We, we haven't really had any problems with uh, dust impacts on the spacecraft itself uh, because it might, uh, one kilometer per second might sound a lot, but it's actually not. Um, I mean, if you see micrometeorite impact in uh, Earth's orbit, and that's at several tens of kilometers per second, so that's what you really need. Well, if you just have one kilometer per second, it doesn't really matter. Plus the dust that comes off the comet because it is so fluffy, doesn't have much of a um, momentum that it can actually transfer and destroy a spacecraft. It mm. was more a problem of the uh, Star Trek uh, issue. Mm. Okay, yeah, thank you, Professor. All right, uh, anyone else uh, have questions uh, for, for Dr. Gertz? Um, I have a final question to you. Uh, there is a, I suppose you want to be the project scientist of the mission to, to Kamehale, right? Don't you? Yeah. Uh, and uh, but then the, how would you get get managed to get an orbiter around uh, Comet Halle because it is is a retrograde it's, uh, yes. comet? Yeah, I know it. It would be very ambitious. I agree. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It the, the problem is one of delta v. Basically, you need a lot of delta v to speed up your spacecraft, mm -hmm. which is why I think. I mean, we're talking about twenty sixty one for the. Uh, perihelion of Halley, mm. but I think it might already be too late to plan a mission uh, just because it's just 40 years and if you plan that you might need like 15 years to get your spacecraft up to speed to actually be able to follow it. I mean, you don't really have to go to orbit, but just spend a little bit more time flying by it um, by reducing the, um, the velocity difference. Um, yeah, it's very challenging. Uh, someone really needs to want to do it. I think it's worth it, but I'm not sure everyone agrees. So you want to prepare for the next next return? Yeah, yes. Um, I mean... but, but you should man, you should try to convince the, the management, the ESA management to 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 study um solo cell. Yeah. I mean the the so the way it works at ESA usually is if you have these very challenging missions, like ESA last well, two years ago, um, when we wrote this white paper, ESA said that we should go back to a comet and also do sample return, and specifically cryo sample return, because that um, should then contain the ices as well. Um, and ESA said this is very worthwhile, and we have to do it at some point. However, we can't do it in the next round because we simply lack the technology to do it within the budget that we have. So um, what ESA then says is that they will start technology studies to address these difficulties. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, yeah, so there are technology studies going on about um, small satellites um, to kind of use as companions if you go to a comet. Um, and there are studies ongoing about a sample return um, to comets, but also to Mars, obviously. Uh, so this is kind of how it works. It all takes a little bit of time. Okay, I see uh, the question. Any idea in designing a spacecraft for the purpose of creating aurora, nature imitating or purely creative or other plasma effects? Well, I mean, this artificial comet experiment was really 
interesting. I, I think we should do it again with modern instruments uh, and bearing in mind what we've learned from Rosetta. Um, I think it would be super interesting because all you need is one spacecraft that explodes this gas canister because we have so many plasma observatories in Earth's magnetosphere right now, you could just use those. Um, and this is another of the mission profiles that we outline in the white paper. Um, it doesn't, well, it could also create aurora, I suppose, um, but I haven't thought about it that much. <laughs> it's a good idea. <laughs> Okay, good. Uh, Cheryl, uh, I think that the, uh, we have to get uh, the next speaker, Professor yeah. Adriano yeah, uh, Campo-Bagato on board. Uh, sure. uh, he's already there. Um, thank you so much, Cheryl. Uh, thank you so much you. for having yeah, me. I hope to meet you again. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye.